you can be an adult, look inward and admit it didn't work out. The relationship didn't work out, but you're not the most important piece. And if you can't sort through your own stuff and realize that if you don't want your children to have identity crisis at 22 years old, they should be the first thought. Hey, I'm Megs and welcome to the Free to Be You podcast. I'm a life alignment coach passionate about helping women uncover who they really are so they can author a life they're obsessed with and move away from self-abandonment into full self-expression. This podcast is created with one purpose, to give you permission to finally free yourself up and be you in every area of your life. We discuss everything from mindset, health and vulnerability to relationships, parenting and more. My guest today is JP Marsh. He's a co-parenting and relationship expert. He's been in a healthy co-parenting relationship himself for well over five years and now advocates for others to help create that same result for their families. This is a topic that's very near and dear to me and I got a lot of gold out of listening to JP and I know you're going to love it. So let's dive in. JP, thanks for coming on the Free to Be You podcast today. I know we've just recently connected in an amazing community and I had to get you on because I know that what you do is going to really resonate with uh, with my audience and my listeners. So thank you for tuning in. I know it's uh, at the end of your day there. So where are you? Uh, where are you based again? I'm in Montana in the US. Awesome. So awesome. I'm about two hours south of Canada. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks for taking some time out of your evening to have this conversation. So I really feel like the most powerful thing you can share with us today is your journey. Because as you know, a lot of the people that listen to my show are women um, over 40. Mm -hmm. That is kind of my intended audience. If you're under 40 and you're listening, that's completely okay, by the way, or whatever age you are, if you're a guy. But I know that for for us as women, we kind of get to this age. A lot of times we find that a lot of people that I've worked with have found that this is a point in their life where they look up and things are not like they were because we've been busy looking after our children and nurturing our, you know, our families and being a wife and being all the things. And then it's, it can be a time where we suddenly have all this space and not as much connection as we had before. So I right. would really, really love to hear your version as a guy of how that has been for you, because I know that your story, as you and I have talked about before we come on the show, is super uh, relatable, let's say. I appreciate what you're doing. And I like your podcast. I've been listening. And my story is, is an identity story, I, you know, more or less. Got into my 30s, had a partner, had a child. The relationship obviously wasn't the right one, but we had a two-year-old together. And at the same time that the relationship ended, my dad died unexpectedly and it sent me into an identity crisis of who am I? You know, I was a single father that I'd never been before and dealing with grief and dealing with the trials and the errors and the battles of co-parenting or attempting to co-parent for a while. And little by little, I, I started working on myself and working on the ways that I sh- should have been because it was who I should be naturally or the way that I was at a younger age, kind of trying to get back to that place of just being content and knowing who I was and not playing the role, I guess, that everybody had gotten used to me being for, you know, half my adult life and then trying to figure out how I was going to raise a daughter and how I was going to be civil or in a good place with my daughter's mother. And it just kind of all started looking inward and working on things and book after book after book after podcast after podcast of <laughs> of ways to 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 change your frame of mind and and you know be more authentic and quit quit worrying, I guess, you know, about yeah. what everybody else thinks you should be and and just be who you're meant to be because it's a lot happier of a place. You know? Oh my gosh, it's so totally speaking my language. Like that is 
essentially what my vision for the world is, is for people to feel like they can be authentic, feel like they can be who they really are. But I love what you said there about how you, (laughs) sorry, let me rephrase that because I don't love that it happened to you, but I love what you said (laughs) about how, you know, that identity crisis. I feel like, you know, you, it's like you're going along this path and you're this and then something happens and now you have to figure out who you are without that, right? Right, right. And you, and I think that what we try and do, and I know that, uh, you know, my approach to things is, which we definitely have to go inward, but rather than try and find out who we were before, mm-hmm. it's really about trying to find out who we are now, like right. rediscovering. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So what was yeah. that process like for you? Because I know you said you, you know, read a lot of books and done a lot of done a lot of um listened to a lot of podcasts, which is a great medium. Mm-hmm. Um, but what what was the process for you? Like how did you start to unravel that and and do that work? Well, I mean, if I'm gonna be completely honest, I was on an online dating site, right? And I You're allowed seeing, to be completely honest well, here, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I I kept seeing well, well, I kept seeing these four letters on the bottom of these profiles and I didn't have any idea what it meant. So I Googled it and then I took a personality test. Ah, is this the Myers-Briggs one? Right. Yes. Mm. I love that quiz. So I took a personality test and it was so eerily accurate, creepy, and it brought up a lot of questions and answered a lot of questions that I didn't know I had about reacting to certain things. And the, you know, the personality type that I, that I am ended up what is your personality it, type, it, by the way? What, INFJ. What INFJ. Uh, like, uh huh. Two percent of the world has my personality type, but it, yeah, it, it, I mean, it was to a T. And so then, after reading all that, then I got kind of into perception and identity, mindset, personal growth, and started just consuming a whole bunch of books around that kind of stuff. And then started getting into psychology and mental health and trauma. And as I got through, I average about 80 books a year on Audible. I I can listen a lot, but I don't watch TV. And so it's it's easy to consume a lot of books. Yeah. And the more that I was going through all these books, the more I started really understanding why I react a certain way or do certain things or, you know, with that personality test and all that stuff. And then it got into, as I progressed in that, the relationship that I had with my ex raising our daughter, because I was changing, it was changing. And so the more clear I was on who I was and the kind of parent I wanted to be, the easier my relationship with my ex became, but also not identifying as her ex or my daughter's mo- uh, dad, then it got into more, what kind of father did I want to be? What kind of role model did I want to be, you know, and I chose to be who I enjoy being, which is the dad that makes her dance in the grocery store aisles. And they got to, you know, as, as everything progressed and as I felt better and more authentic, everything around me became better and easier on a, on a daily to day level. And then the relationship with my ex became phenomenal. I mean, now it's do barbecue, sit at school functions, go to soccer games and sit, you know, and do some holidays together. And I still talk to her parents when our daughter's going with them and she talks to my mom and, and all these different things. And it's, it's not weird to us or the people that were around or her boyfriend, but societal norms and pressures make it abnormal. Because it's oh, rare, so you know, it's everybody so has rare. to be, you're supposed to be mad at your ex and you're supposed to hate each other. But, but the more that I worked through my stuff and essentially grieved the relationship that was over and let it go, then it just became a place where we are raising our daughter. But my daughter is her own person and I am my own person, even knowing that I'm an involved, loving, caring dad. I didn't let myself get too wrapped up in being the single father identity and living the next 15 years with that identity and then having another identity crisis when she starts her own life in college or and stuff like that. So I love that. That's such a good point. <clears throat> That's such a good point. And, and that's kind of what I was getting at before is like we need to rediscover who we are now and that mm-hmm. is going to change. But if you have a healthy, if you have a healthy relationship with that process, 
then it doesn't matter how many times you go through it. You know what to right. do, right? You know exactly. Well, you've got the tools. You've mastered those tools right. and you're going to go through it again and you're going to shift and change and it's just part of life. Like, and it's just letting it go. That's awesome. Yeah. And I 100% yeah. agree with you. you saying that it's rare because I have um, been through a similar journey like you and I chatted before mm-hmm. we got on, on today. Right. And we ha- I've got a new partner and we have an amazing relationship with his ex-wife. She's a lovely person. She's a great mom. She's got, they've got great kids. I'm so blessed to be, you know, accepted into, into his family. And what I think is really amazing is that they have held both her and my partner through that process mm-hmm. as a family, as a unit, because that that's her whole life, right? So they haven't just right. like kind of like um they didn't divorce her. Right. They didn't right, divorce right, right. her from right. her family, which is super important. And so she's had right. this like beautiful help like she's been held in this beautiful way by this whole family. And they both have as a couple, as a family, to kind of find their way. And that's not always the mm-hmm. case. Like on my side of the fence, it's complete opposite. It was like I lost a whole family um mm-hmm. through that process, which I also had to grieve um as a right. result. And that was was heartbreaking. So for me, just coming into this space where they had already created that, like we've been together a year, they'd already created that beautiful space as as his new partner. I was just, I was actually inspired by that. Mm-hmm. So inspired by that. Uh, and and just feel blessed that like there's just no drama. It's fantastic. Right. But it does right. take two people it, most of the time. It takes two people doing yeah. the work. Yeah. There's a there's a few things that I repeat to people who are not in a place like I am, you mostly are. It's the same idea as looking inward, you know, and trying to figure out your identity. You know, most of your women listeners that are 40 and going through kids growing up, leaving the house, trying to figure out who I am if I'm not a mom or a wife or corporate CEO or businesswoman or you know, yeah, whatever ends, all these right. different things. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's the same kind of, same kind of aha or self-reflection scenario, because you can be an adult, look inward and admit, you know, it didn't work out. The relationship didn't work out, but you're not the most important piece. And if you can't sort through your own stuff and realize that if you don't want your children to have identity crisis, at 22 years old, they should be the first thought. And so if you don't figure out who you are as a parent and let that shit go, the animosity or the anger or the resentment or the jealousy and figure out who you are now going forward and and have the kid's best interest, you're making it hard for them, you know? And I didn't want my daughter to grow up in a place of anxiety and guilt and, you know, talking, hearing me say things about her mom when she's here and then hearing her mom say things about me when she's there and then playing both sides and being manipulated as a weapon or a tool or a, a means of control or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. And so once you can figure out the identity that you, you know, or who you are as a parent or what kind of parent you want to be and what kind of child you want to raise. Then when, you know, like you were saying, you're going to go through it a few times, but when my daughter gets out of school and moves away and starts her own life, it'll be easier for me to sort of reevaluate who I am as, you know, the dad that sees her every few months maybe, or when I go on vacation, you know, but yeah. Mine are moving out. Yeah, that's so a ways I hear off. you. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> I got a few years left. Oh my gosh. Like what you just said there, literally, the reason that I even was interested in seeing and getting to know my new partner was because the very first conversation that we had was about kids first. He's got four, right. I've got three. And we were we were both we both entered this relationship with the kids first attitude yeah. because of where right. we we're at. And we just looked through every decision that we've made has been from mm-hmm. their best interest first. 
And so when it mm-hmm. came to, we met in September when, and Christmas was not only a few months down the road. Like not far we, off. Yeah. Right. And like, so one of them's eight and then the others are uh, teenagers. Mine are all teenagers. And so we just all, we just had Christmas all together. That's what they always did. And right. I just, I went with my kids and there was no, nothing was awkward. Everyone was just normal. And the right. kids and his kids in particular, they didn't have, nothing changed for them. No. Nothing changed for them. They had everyone right. there that they loved. You know, I'm sure it was still a little bit kind of strange for want of a better word, but nothing changed. And that was so important to me to be able to be. The biggest thing for me is that he has three girls and they Mm -hmm. are all teenagers and all I want to be is, you know, a role in their life as an example. Right. Because I'm not their mom. Their mom's amazing. They don't need another mom. They need like someone who is a mature adult who can model what it looks like to... Have a healthy relationship. And so well, I, mean, I take that yeah. very, very seriously. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's nothing bad about being a bonus mom. You know? <laughs> well, we'll see how they feel I mean, about that. But you know what I mean? Like it's it's so yeah. important that that uh, we do put the kids first. And I think that's something that, yeah, mm-hmm. I love the way you said that. And like my ex is in a blended family situation. You know, they, I mean, they're not married, but they have lived together for the last few years and he's got a son and it's not a deal where they're pushing, you know, like, oh, he's the, you know, like he's just there. He just is who he is. Yeah. And some parts of we set very clear and very hard lined boundaries early on in our co-parenting journey. And so some of the conflicts that typically would happen have been avoided by us predetermining certain things. Um, We had made a deal a long time ago that if her or I started dating somebody, we got to meet them before she would. And so there was never a trope of guys that my ex was dating in and out of the house all the time that she was witnessing or anything like that. There's not a revolving door of women that are in my life that she meets, you know, every couple months and then the relationship falls apart and she got to know somebody and then now they're gone. As she gets older and older, you know, some of those things might become a little bit more laxed, but to a six-year-old, I mean, yeah. anybody that she has met is her friend, not my friend, you know, that's just how it works. Some of those, some of the pitfalls and the arguments have been avoided. You know, we had, we would call each other if something came up instead of a babysitter first. And so we, I always had the option. We don't have a lot of, you know, she comes and goes as she pleases, but the rules at my house are the same as at mom's house. And so there's no trying to pull one over on us. And the one thing that I see a lot, especially parents who identify really strongly as just a parent in a relationship that is a back and forth kind of relationship, is that they force their kids to grow up a lot faster than they need to. And like, I am protective, very protective of my daughter being a kid and allowing her to play pretend and build pillow forts and let's go to the park and you know stuff like that and she knows who she is because I let her tell me who she is I'm trying to set her up to not not have identity crisis I don't know if that's possible but you know we're all gonna have it sometime (laughs) yeah (laughs) but I love that I I think it's true you're you're instilling values in her early and that's super important and that comes from the awareness and the work that you've done and all of that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff um and so on that what I would really like to know is because now obviously you're in a in a role where you're wanting to or you are sort of coaching other people through this mm-hmm. process based on what you've have ha- had happen and been able to create. Right. So tell me a little bit about what that looks like for you. How are you um, how are you helping others now navigate this space? I work with people one on one. Most people are sort of toe dipping into the journey of finding their new reality, figuring out who they are now, trying to make some sort of, you know, I say a lot that being civil is something. I mean, it's not something you may not be able to get to a place like where I'm at or you're at, but being a united front and being civil is, isn't something to just cast away. I mean, there's people that can't even drop the kids off at the other parent's house they got to drop it off at a middle, you know, a grandma's house or something. And the other parent picks them up because they absolutely can't get along. And so I work with people trying to better their relationship with the other parent, whether it's 
a new divorce or a new breakup, or they've just tired of fighting and tired of not being able to get along, which it's sad that it is more common to be at each other's throats than it is to just be adults and put the kids first. But a lot of it is realizing that you're not perfect. <laughs> and so you can't blame the other person as much as you want. And there's actionable things. And there's and there's a lot of stuff that everybody just reactively does rather than being aware of intentions. Or for me, I used to get defensive all the time and I would get defensive and then it would turn into a fight and then it would be a big fight and then it would not end well. And once I started not being so instant, judgmental, defensive, all that stuff. And so I work with people one-on-one -on -one, and if there is a mistake that you can make, I've made it. And so the trial and error is, is not lacking on my end. And so, yeah. So you um, help people to navigate that, I guess the chaos of, that occurs in these spaces. And mm -hmm. most of that's come from your own experience. Mm -hmm. It took me, if I would have had somebody, if I'd have known that there was people that I could have gotten in touch with to sort of give me an objective view or an objective ear instead of friends and family, because you know, when you break up, they have the ones that side with them. You have the ones that side with you and everything you're going to hear is saying that it's their fault and they're picking on you and they're doing it. And you have to get out of the reinforcement zone of everybody telling you that you're right, they're wrong. And realize that it really does take both of you to fight about everything anything and without being able to empathize and see where the other person's coming from or have somebody bring it to your attention you just always assume that it's them <laughs> so true well i mean it's very <clears throat> difficult for uh for for someone that loves you to be switzerland when you're upset right right Right. So right. of course they're gonna they're gonna want to soothe you and they're going to want to, you know, have you mm -hmm. feel heard and all of that. But there's a lot of different ways to do that. And I think when someone knows you and loves you, it's very difficult for them to to stay in that um, objective place. Right. So that that's so great. So you're you're like providing a serve or you're providing a space for people to be able to to get everything out, but then have it reflected back in a very objective way. Right. And most family members and friends aren't going to hold you accountable. So true. And so if there's a certain level of accountability that you have to have in yourself, and if you don't do it yourself, nobody that's in your life is going to really do it for you. Even, even a new partner isn't going to tell you to necessarily buck up and do the shit that you're supposed to be doing. And so if you're an hour late picking your child up and dropping your child off every week without communicating to your ex, and so then they're sitting around wondering if you're going to how, how late you're going to be. Everybody in your life, more or less, you know, not it's not a everybody kind of thing, but the majority of people that you're around are going to be like, well, I don't understand why they're so mad. It's only an hour. Well, it's an hour every time because you're mm -hmm. not doing what you're supposed to be doing. But then at the same time, the accountability comes in when all of a sudden the other person's an hour late and you blow your fuse because you're they're disrespecting your time and you're sitting around waiting on the double standard is one of the, the bigger things that I sort of call people out on. <laughs> oh, I was just literally about to ask you a question, which was what are some of the common things that you see come up? So that's one of them. Is there any others? The double standard is, is a, is a big one. There's three main things that really block being able to start a good, healthy co-parenting communication relationship. The first main one is you're going to struggle and it's going to be hard if you refuse to do work on yourself, deal with the trauma, let the relationship grieving process happen, get over yourself and basically get up and leave the pity party because you're the only one feeling sorry for yourself. The second one is... The double standard, you have to have clear and firm and hold the boundaries that you set. Along with that is the double standards. If you don't hold your boundaries or have boundaries, you know, the double standard goes along with it. If you don't want them to stalk you on social media, then you shouldn't be stalking them. You know, oh, if, that's if, they're, if it's none of their business that who you're dating, it's none of your business who they're dating. The, the third big one is don't engage. When they quit getting a reaction, they'll quit looking for it a reaction for the most part. 
but also don't engage in the gaslighting if they gaslight. Don't engage with the manipulation. Don't engage when they say things and you react and then it's a big fight and you're standing in the driveway screaming at each other with the kid crying in the back seat because one person said something and instead of just saying having the boundaries and saying unless it's got something to do with our child and and some people are not able to get along very well for a long time and if it doesn't have anything to do with being a parent or the needs of the child you don't need to engage if they're calling you or texting one of the big ones is is getting calls and texts when the one who hasn't let the relationship go wants to know what the other one is still doing when they're not around because whatever mm-hmm. they're thinking you still want to control or whatever the case may be and so just because they text you in the morning or call and maybe use saying that the child is the reason that they're calling or whatever. If it's none of their bit, you don't have to engage in that kind of conversation or even respond to the text. If the other one has your children and they text you to see with some excuse just to see if you're home, hey, I got to swing by and grab this and you know it's BS, then just say no. If they want to continue picking and prodding, then you just say, this has got nothing, it's not your business anymore. Yeah, yeah. But that's that's one of the, you know, if you if you quit engaging, but the double standards comes up a lot. Yeah. And yeah. Well, it's that old age old saying, right? Like hurt people, hurt people. Right. Yeah. So misery loves company. Right. Yeah. So we need to do the work and then we need to let them do theirs. And if they're not, then I love that. That's such great advice. Such great advice. And going back and forth. When it's done, it's done. Going back and forth with a past partner or leading them on, or I don't want you, but I don't want anybody else to have you playing with emotions. That happens quite a bit, but it's, Mm. if it's done, it's done. Let the relation, you know, if you can't let the relationship go, it's going to be hard. And if the other person is having a hard time letting the relationship go, then you have to set clear boundaries to separate. We're co-parenting. Or we're kind of half trying to make this work. If if you go back and forth and you're muddy in the Mm -hmm. waters all the time, you know, but it's a comfort zone kind of deal, just like being a parent or being, you know, the the identities and, and things that we get used to, you know, their identity is with that person. And so trying to get out of that, you know, just like they say, your comfort zone is where your dreams go to die. So So if you dream of a happy life, the worst place you can be is in a miserable relationship that isn't going to work, but you just feel comfortable there because you can't be alone without feeling lonely. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So true. That's a good one to have to learn actually. And I think that's something we need to learn before we have a new relationship as well. Definitely speaking from experience. (laughs) It's like learning how to love your own company, right? So One of the big things I I talk about on this podcast is feeling freed to be you. And the reason I say freed and not free is because I believe that the freedom is on the other side of the work, Mm -hmm. right? So yeah, the work never stops, to be clear. (laughs) The work never stops, like another level, another devil, right? But to be freed of it, you need to move through it. You need to be Mm -hmm. on the other side of it. That's where everything new begins. That's where, you know, that next level begins. That's where the new, the rediscovered identity lives. You have to go through it. And so the D on the end of that free is really, really important. (laughs) I've had people tell me it's grammatically incorrect and all sorts of things. I'm like, no, it doesn't matter what you think. This is, this is what I believe. And so Mm -hmm. it's not to say that there's not a lot of great things and memories to to take with you from the past and from even from your past relationship but it is the past and then there's the mm-hmm. future and then you have to go through through doing that work and getting to the other side to be freed right. of it and so i love right. that you've been on that journey and that you're now sharing that experience with other people and it's such a valuable thing because you're not coming from a place of being an expert it's more like right. you're you're the the friend that can be Switzerland that most of us don't have mm-hmm. with all the experience right. to go along with it. It's fantastic, JP. I love it. I love what you're doing. Well, I mean, they say your your best to serve is somebody that is three to five years behind you in the same journey. And so where I am right now with continuously working. I'm in a good place as a father. I'm in a good place as a professional and where I live, how I live and with my ex and with the woman that I'm dating, everything is, is going really well. 
three years ago was good, not as well. Two years, two, three years before that was when things really started to shift and sort of start falling into place. Co-parenting stuff, the way that I created my own reality around me. And so as I started and worked and really started creating the reality that I wanted, regardless of everything else with the instant gratification of the world we live in, it takes time. And there's times where it's frustrating and I want to give up and I just the heck with it all. And but most of the time I like the journey that I'm on. But it it is. It's a journey. It'll be the rest of my life. I mean, I could just as easily fall back into an old identity and you know, it's a possibility, I guess, but not I one that I would so. want to. <laughs> yeah. So how can people get in touch with you? If, you? if you're finding that what JP is saying is resonating with you and you think that, oh my gosh, this is just the guy I've been looking for. And do you just actually work with, with men or women? Do you work with both? Uh, with both. The scenarios are pretty universal back and forth, whether it's not identical, but the double standard goes both ways. One person has unresolved feelings for the other person and it creates conflict goes both ways. I mean, most of the stuff, most of the big things that are, that are complicating moving forward and creating a life where you're not together are universal. And so the the men, women aspect of it is kind of the same. Um, Beautiful. Mostly on Instagram. I do a lot of website. Social media is not necessarily my favorite. And so to track me down is on Instagram. And that's mostly where I post and and do all that stuff. So yeah, awesome. Well, I mean, I can pop your Instagram uh, handle in the show notes and maybe your email address if people just get in touch with you just straight up. But yeah, for I mean, sure. I think that it's it's uh, it's a beautiful thing that you're doing, and I'm really excited to have met you at this stage oh, sure. in your yes. journey because I feel like this is probably more than likely going to grow into something bigger than than you expect. It normally does, and I know that's my how I found it anyway. But if yeah. you've resonated with JP's um, story and you think Think that this is something uh, that you would love to to chat on, chat about, or work on. Definitely get in touch with him because I've spoke to you twice now, and I'm mm-hmm. inspired. So I'm sure there's going to be plenty of people who find that listening to this conversation. Is there any sort of last thoughts that you have, sort of based on on what we've talked about? JP, I guess the thing that would be probably, ha- if you don't, probably the thing that you could add is like, what's the first thing that you think someone could do if they find themselves in in a co-parenting situation that's not working? What would be the first thing you would suggest? Communication. Communication is key. And understanding. Understanding what is actually being said or what the motives of what's being said. But ultimately, I honestly believe that everybody is doing the best they can with the tools that they have. And so if the tools that you have aren't enough or working for the life that you want, find ways to get more tools, whether it's mentors or coaches or podcasts or books, the more information that you can have on things is is not going to hurt you in any way. I love that. <laughs> but, that's about and, it. <laughs> yeah. And and I think too, just as a, you know, sort of my final thoughts are that we do need someone like you who we can who we can chat to and we can have that non-discriminative conversation with, I suppose, like mm-hmm. non-biased, non-biased, that's the word I was looking for, right. conversation with. And outside of that, I think is just knowing yourself better. Right. You know, you're listening to this and you think, wow, like I wouldn't even know where to start. Like definitely get in touch with JP for that sort of side of kind of working through the challenges that you're having. And if you want to know yourself better, then get in, you can get in touch with me. That's where I come in. I want you to feel like you know yourself and you can do that internal work, like facilitating the space where people can actually uncover what's there and the value that they can take forward to be able to navigate situations like this. This is literally the thing that got me through. I didn't know who Mm -hmm. I was and I didn't know what was important to me and I didn't know how to put language around that that was powerful and empowering. Then I'd probably still be in the soup of it all. But because Mm -hmm. I knew those things and with such clarity, know what the triggers are I know the things that I want to try and move towards and and move away from um I right, know that that right. was like super super important so between you and I we've got it all covered <laughs> I think so Not quite. I a think lot of so it. 
a lot of it. Well, at least at this stage. At, <laughs> at this, this stage, stage and everything. For sure. Amazing. Yeah. Well, JP, thank you so much again for giving up part of your evening to come and and, uh, and chat with me about this. I think it's hugely valuable conversation. There's going to be a lot of value mic drop moments that I've had throughout that we'll be sharing along the way as well. And uh, you Thanks enjoy the rest me. of your evening. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for listening into this episode. As I said, if you did find it interesting, please share it. Everybody else, I will see you or you will hear me in the next show.